And we're live, and I'm here with Whitney Davis, and her and I in the past got to watch at least Citizen Four. I don't know if we did any Liberty on the Rocks events together when she was uh, with me here in Los Angeles, and I know now she's uh, taken a, a tour of the United States and been around a couple other places. How have you been since uh, you left LA? Oh man, I've been great. <laughs> uh, I miss LA. Like I miss the weather, I miss the, it seems like there was a good group of anarchists there. So I really miss that. But, you know, I spent uh, about three years in Dallas, love nice. Dallas. Um, and then I just moved to Seattle last year and I'm still trying to see how I like it. <laughs> yeah. I, I hear Austin is probably the closest thing to what you and I would like in terms of, you know, politics and general atmosphere. In, in my opinion, Cody Wilson is the goat, no matter what anybody yeah. else says. And he's out there and a lot of other interesting like crypto people and, and even maybe some more anarcho communist people are, are out there. There's a general, you know, weird vibe in, in Portland and in Austin, but right. I think, you know, the, uh, um, the more natural habitat of Texas, uh, tempers it out more. Whereas Oregon, it kind of just leans in, in a direction that may be a little bit more antagonistic to markets and, and things like that. But I've been, I've been to Dallas before and I really like it. I, I was in uh, Houston this past December one time. And then um, I was there a few years ago as well. And so it's crazy that I haven't done Austin yet, but Seattle's one of my yeah. homes away from home. Two of my best friends live up there and I've been like, five or six times in my life it's been a few years now but you know speaking of like that's also a place where you know it's similar to portland that whole northwest mm -hmm. area and i i watched like the video you posted recently of like the live um you know it's funny like journalism and i, I know you probably don't think of yourself like a journalist but you know Not with the decentralization <laughs> of journalism you you've right. gotten to participate how was how was Chaz? how's that autonomous zone yeah i mean to your point about journalism, I find it so funny. People are commenting, thank you for your journalism. I'm like, yeah. people get degrees in this. I am not <laughs> a journalist, but okay. Um, it, okay, we went Saturday during the day and it was kind of a blast until we were leaving. I can get to that point, but uh -huh. um, it really felt like a block party. Uh, and that's kind of what's common around Seattle during the summers is these different neighborhoods have block parties anyway. So it kind of mm -hmm. had that vibe, but it was weird because no one accepted money. Technically you could donate, uh, you could take anything you wanted, you could set up where you wanted. Um, and for the most part, it was still peaceful in doing that mm -hmm. as you know, an anarcho-capitalist, I don't really see how that's going to be sustainable. And we've seen at least some videos on the internet where there's been some conflicts, you know, people stealing tents and things like that. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. But for the most part, it was fine. Um, I would say there were a couple people that they didn't want there and they had an interesting way of physically removing them so um, hoppians? right deep down <laughs> i think they're hoppians um you know i i try to compare it to the way that the police would do it i think there there may be three different ways so there's you know the state and the police mm -hmm. there's the anarcho-communist and then yep. probably anarcho-capitalist with private security um mm -hmm. and the way we know the cops would do it so I'll give you an example. And oh, this has been going around. I don't know if you've seen on a lot of the right wing news media where it's Christian street preacher thrown out and chokehold. And I, I saw that and I didn't, um, you know, let me say this in the politest way possible. And and I say this as a as a professing, not just Orthodox Christian, but like a, a minister, I'm a deacon in the, in the, you know, in the larger church. Um, there's, there's a way of tact and there's a way of doing these things. Um, either I think he was not all there marbles wise and, or just from what little footage I saw and, or, um, you know, it was not an act of good faith of trying to, you know, bring 
folks on to Jesus. One of the reasons I wanted to interview you is I think mm-hmm. you're one of the more good faith voices, you know, you self-identify as anarcho-capitalist, which should be antagonistic to probably a lot of the ideologies of the people there. But, you know, you don't come off combative. You're not out there saying state is going state and, you know, things like <laughs> that. You know what I mean? Ridiculous. <laughs> like, mean, yeah. you, you know what I mean? The stereotype of the yellow and black <laughs> ball meme. Like, yeah, I, I don't see I, you I doing I don't live that. in my mom's basement. I don't have a no. next beard. I mean, I, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no, <laughs> I don't see you doing that. I also come at it as a jujitsu guy. So I know a lot oh, about cool. like strangles. And, and in fact, my, my professor of jujitsu works with a lot of cops. And he put out a video about why his position is against, you know, the ban on, on chokeholds and things like that. And that's a whole like technical other debate. Um, but yeah, l- let me know about that situation with the preacher. Because I've seen a little bit. But I mean, again, I'm getting this a lot secondhand. Yeah, I mean, so I did live stream part of that. And so you can see it on the Mises Caucus page. And I- On Facebook, right? On Facebook, right. And so I thought he was mentally ill or he was on Mm -hmm. drugs. And that's something that's common in Seattle. You know, we have a lot of homeless people that are mentally ill or on drugs. So it wasn't really shocking to me to see someone like that. And then it- he yes he added christianity in there but i'm not going to sit here and say that he's you know a model christian that Mm -hmm. people need to look up to um (laughs) so what happened there was a speaking stage and he had a very loud boom box and went right up to the speaking stage and was just blaring amazing grace and (laughs) (laughs) You talk about tact. <laughs> uh, probably not the best tact. Love the song. It's great. But um, so they tried to remove him from there. He kept interrupting it. This this thing went on for, mm-hmm. I don't know, 30 minutes or more. I mean, it took forever. So the way they tried to remove him, and I guess the, they're trying to do it peacefully, is they would link arms and kind of surround them and just move them out. Mm -hmm. But of course this wasn't that easy because he's flailing everywhere and he's like, no, I don't want to leave and all this stuff. Uh, He's falling to the ground. They're trying to pick him back up. At one point they do drag him. At one point someone does throw a punch and ultimately, I mean, he gets moved out and it's, it's still that weird method where they're just walking and they're Mm -hmm. moving them out. Um, And I've seen that twice. So that was the first time that they did that. That's like Red Um, Rover, like the children's game. Yeah, exactly. Actually. Um, Now compare that to how the police would do that. Mm -hmm. They punch the guy for sure. A lot. (laughs) They use uh, their taser probably, uh, probably put a knee on the guy, you know, Mm -hmm. and, try to arrest him and who knows if he would have survived. And so, yes, someone threw a punch at the guy. Was that justified? I don't know. I didn't really see from that angle. Um, But comparing those two, I would prefer the more peaceful method because everyone ended up fine. The Chaz decentralized police, whatever, (laughs) whatever, whether transactional or just free, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Donations based, (laughs) (laughs) whatever their security production. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) That'd be great. uh, If you had like a Venmo on like a poster or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, and and then you look at maybe how private security would have done it. Maybe they, um, maybe they would have been trained in jujitsu or something mm-hmm. where they could actually de-escalate it better and and not take as long, but also not hurt them. Um, so just, I want to give people that perspective is I don't want to demonize the way people are doing it, but it's also, it wasn't very efficient. And that's, so that's how all that went down. That's a good point you have, like on the violence perspective, Right. There's a whole range of, of violence that could happen. You know, the one, you know, the ultimate sense, which kind of started a lot of these writings, but really was just one piece in a history is the deadly force. And then before that, you know, you're talking about like the striking 
And, you know, striking, no matter what type of striking you do, leaves a little bit of brain damage. A lot of the CTE studies, you know, for, for boxers who've died, for people in the NFL, you know, who've eventually gone crazy from it, it, you know, it's due to the, to the impact, the high impact from, from the strikes. And one of the things that like jujitsu was developed years ago, like millennia ago by like Buddhist monks in India and in Japan to immobilize people and then to run away. And the thing is, nothing happens to you when you do that. The big issue with like George Floyd and what happened is after somebody is rendered unconscious, you have to let go. Um, every second you spend after someone's already lost conscience, that's where you increase the risk of death. And, and so there is always this real risk of death. But as you said, when someone is actually trained in jujitsu or any submission grappling, you know, that's my particular art, you know, really like a judo person or a catch as you can wrestling. Like there are a few different grappling arts, you know, even like an American wrestler who could, you know, hold somebody down. Um, they know that you can hold somebody for like seven to 15 seconds at most. And after that, you know, if, if, if they haven't lost consciousness, you're not doing the technique properly. It's a technical thing. And so you just, you just let go after that. So maybe like you said, a private security a producer or firm would have rendered them unconscious and then taken them over instead of uh, red rovering them, you know, slowly out and, and then, you know, throwing some punches in the middle too. Right. You know? So that, wow. that's a funny that's point about like efficiency. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. What'd you say? That's really interesting. I mean, I don't have any kind of martial arts background. So hearing that, I mean, it just makes sense. And someone may make a point that, well, you could have police train in jujitsu and things like that. And I know some do, and that's mm -hmm. great. And I think they should, um, but there's still a different level of accountability with private security and police. And, and we can try to improve accountability with police, but it's still different with private security. Yeah, I think Mises' critique of socialism, you know, in that was it 1920s, was that the big difference is profits and losses. You know, police mm -hmm. department, there, there are no consequences. They've got the immunization that Justin Amash, the only libertarian woo -woo, in Congress now, <laughs> is uh, trying to get rid of, you know, on a federal level. Um, but I don't know if you saw what Trump did today, like with his executive order, he's just kind of giving money. He's giving them more money to do mm -hmm. more training. And I, I don't know how, if at all, you know, that's going to translate. And like I said, my professor of jujitsu, he, he does, he, he travels um, and he has other people underneath him as well, other black belts. And they travel and they teach people. But really, it's like at most one day a year, you know, that these people are getting trained unless oh, they're wow. doing it as a hobby, you know, yeah. out, out, outside of work. Like re requirement wise, it's very low. I think it's probably easier to become a cop than, you know to practice cosmetics without an occupational license in, in a lot of areas, which is, you know, ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. That's a great point. Uh, so and, what and were you saying? No Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, there's no way they can retain it with one day. You're no. just wasting your time kind of, but no. wow. Yeah. Especially with the whole, you know, the whole culture of escalation that they have, you know, you deescalate one day, but you have all these habits from the other 360 plus days of the year. It's, it's going to be ridiculous. Early, earlier, you were mentioning that uh, potentially they were going to go hop on you for a little bit. What, what was it that you were saying or uh, inferencing earlier? Uh, you said there was some troubles towards the end of your visit of Chaz? Not for me, but for, okay. I don't know if they were Proud Boys. I That kind of you know MAGA hat wearing people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> showed up uh, as we were heading home okay. and it was this guy and it was actually a black man in a MAGA hat carrying an American flag and I don't <laughs> know which was triggering was the hat or the flag or a combination of both but it was uh -huh. really funny to see kind of. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's grifting so, season as some people say yeah <laughs> <laughs> so he and I've come to find out that he's been going every day now. So he oh, was wow. here Saturday and then he's been going every single day with his American flag and MAGA hat and just walking down. And I think his, I heard today his point was he wanted to get the American flag from the uh, police precinct and reclaim the American flag. I don't know why that matters so much, but okay. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> on Saturday, he and his friends, um, 
just came walking through. That's all they did as far as I'm aware is just walked through. And of course this huge crowd started gathering around him. Um, you know, you've probably seen those videos of Antifa and Proud Boys brawling in Portland. And yeah. I was really expecting something like that to happen. There was a little bit of a scuffle and then it stopped. And then for the most part, it was just this giant crowd. It, it's the last video on the page that I recorded, just walking them out and following them even outside of the Chaz zone. Um, so again, it, it was, it was peaceful mm -hmm. <laughs> removal, physical. Yeah. Removal. Yeah. Um, I would say, uh, you know, it, it's very, to me, it's such a paradox because it's okay. This is a community property. Who's to say who's allowed and who's not allowed. I guess mob rule is deciding who's allowed and who's not allowed. So, you know, who's allowed to speak and who's not allowed to speak. Um, it, so it's just an interesting thing to see it play out because as an anarchist, I would like to see anarchist societies play mm -hmm. out, um, even if it's an anarcho-communist society. I don't want to be a part of it, but yeah. you go ahead. And if it works out for you, then we can learn from it. Cool. Um, so that's kind of what I'm observing now. So they have different ways of physical removal. They have physical removal. There is <laughs> and border. A, <laughs> right. And a border. It's a very loose border, but they have uh -huh. a border. Um, there's no single leader. There's a bunch of different leaders and a bunch of different groups creating. Yeah, I, saw, I saw the gentleman with the uh, AR-15 passing some AR-15s out. I was, uh, <laughs> I was wondering about that. Very American, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Did you so, did you get any feeling or I mean, it was a short time, it seems like, you know, um, but did you get any sense of that leadership structure? It, it does seem like, you know, they're preventing graffiti in some in some spots. When you talk about the flag thing, I was thinking about so many different video games I've played. I don't know if you ever played like Halo or Call of Duty. Oftentimes there's like a capture play. the flag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's what it seems like. Like, like it, right. there's a lot of elements yeah. to LARPing. You know what I mean? In in what you're yeah. talking about, um, the Proud Boys versus Antifa, um, you know, acting out, you know, almost a, some World War II drama there, you know, Nazis versus anti-fascists or, uh, you know, Italians, but, you know, whatever they uh, think they're representing on uh, on those sides. So it's 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 That's interesting. Crazy. And then the imagery of uh, of a black man in a MAGA hat carrying American flag while other people are likely, I don't know if it was in Chaz, but definitely in other places, burning the American flag. Mm -hmm. And um it, it, I've, I've always, um, I've always had different feelings. I, I'd love to get your take on this too, because for me, um, I've just always been super open in terms of just hearing people out. And so I grew up, I would say, uh, not the most typical Democrat, but I definitely grew up, you know, in a house of of Democrats and a house of parents you know who used to subscribe to even marxism but grew out of that to being more just like you know cnn npr uh democrats uh, but i always had more of a glenn greenwald jeremy scahill streak like the citizen four film on edward snowden like civil liberties like the way i've heard other people phrase it and which agrees to me is like i've always prioritized the matters so like scott horton and dave smith for me like you know war is number one issues of, of borders. I am an open borders guy, like things, things about borders, things about like civil violations. Those have always been at the forefront because they seem to be the, the biggest harm. Um, and, and sometimes some of the, the, the Mises crowd wouldn't emphasize it as much, which is why, you know, I began reading a lot. I don't know if you ever delve into the so-called left libertarian space of like the center for stateless society, a, a lot of their writings called to me because a lot of them had, you know, mostly maybe progressive friends or they grew up in that environment. Um, at, at the same time, you know, being Christian, there happened to be a lot of folks on the Mises side that happened, you know, to be prominent Catholics or, or Protestants or this or that and the third. And so there is like, I, I kind of feel like a cultural tug to to both. So it's interesting the way you you presented it, like you want to see the situation play out. 
but not necessarily, you know, be directly involved. But I, but you're also, like I said, you I don't know if you find yourself to be more measured. I see you as more measured in some of the ways in which you're even analyzing it. Like a lot of people are a lot more negative, you know, kind of want to just, you know, break that space up or something. I mean, I try to be. I try to be <laughs> objective. <laughs> and, and here's the thing is when we knew each other, uh, when I lived in L.A., like 2013, 14, 15, something like that, mm -hmm. um, I was newly anarcho-capitalist. So I think everyone goes through that phase where they're just hardcore anarchist and yeah. everyone else is wrong and I am right and there's no way of looking at anything with any nuance. Um, and then I got a job <laughs> and worked in the <laughs> <laughs> and I, I uh, made friends outside of, you know, school and uh, outside of the anarchist circle and things like that and started getting all these different perspectives. And it's like, you know, there's nuance in life. Um, so try to, I, I don't know. I, I feel like if I stay objective, then, then I can have a, I can reach more people because at least they can respect me and that I'm not just projecting my bias on what I see. And so mm -hmm. I've been able to talk to my normal everyday friends that maybe, honestly, I've got a huge mix of friends. So I've got, you know, the social conservatives, the Republicans, the Trump people. Still in I, Seattle or like back so. in Texas? <laughs> <laughs> No, none of that here. Um, <laughs> like Texas, Arkansas, you know, I'm from Arkansas. Um, and then I've got people like Bernie bros and Hillary Clinton supporters and just general Democrats and leftists and not a lot of libertarian like friends outside of the, you know, activist circle. I'm, I'm um, with you on that. It's a <laughs> minority. If anything, I have a few who are um, maybe libertarian curious, you know, absolutely would not be capital L, would be lowercase l, maybe just more generically anti-authoritarian and less attached, you know, nobody who's going to divest in a large way, you know, from the welfare state, but people who would be more serious about getting rid of like the warfare state and things like that. Yeah, and this has been a great time because I've had my friends that were supporting Hillary or supporting Bernie. Well, I guess more Hillary. And then they're mm -hmm. looking at Biden and now they're learning more about <laughs> Hillary. They're, you know, Biden doesn't really have anything to offer. Plus, you know, the crime bills. Um, I mean, there's just so much to not like about him if you're a, a liberal today. And mm -hmm. then... Uh, you know, I have a friend that voted for Hillary and she was all about Hillary and Trump was the worst ever. And she's just now learning about the WikiLeaks and wow. you know, what came out in 2016. And she's just, uh. just, her mind is blown. Like, how could this happen? What's going to do? And she's horrible. And I can't believe I ever voted for her. And I don't know who to vote for now because I don't like Biden and I don't like Trump. Thankfully, we have Joe Jorgensen. Uh, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> there you go. So, you know, I, it's a great time to be a libertarian right now, actually. <laughs> Are you making that first woman president pitch to them at all? Or has anyone ever, like, threatened to cancel you or unfriend you on any of the social media or anything? Oh, thankfully, no, they haven't. I've been trying really hard not to get canceled because I like my job. <laughs> oh, okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> But it, it's definitely been easier to talk to my left friends about a female candidate um, and bring them around to libertarianism, which is great because there's not a lot of women <laughs> in libertarianism. Mm -hmm. um, and so That's I right. haven't really, <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I haven't really made the pitch of, you know, it could be the first female president, but I've just been like, okay, old white man, old white man, here's, you know, a woman. Oh, and she says all these great things and does all these, you know, she's really good on, I think, almost everything. Um, but she says the right things to, on the social, 
on the civil rights issues mm -hmm. where I can reach out to my friends like that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's you. You feel comfortable doing it. the The interesting thing, you know, like you said, it's a, uh, it's a mostly you know male dominated space, and you know sometimes uh, people even stereotype it like a incel space or something too to try to cross it over, you know, with uh, other alt right groups or or something like that. Um, <laughs> and you know, it, it comes from somewhere. It's not baseless, but it's also not you know all the way true. It, you know, it's part of that that internet culture that you joked about the basement <laughs> earlier. Right. Um, it's like, uh, she doesn't have the baggage of all these people, but I think the, the biggest hurdle that anyone would have is just like this idea of voting for a third party is just so unfathomable. Like it's mm -hmm. just, it's so deeply ingrained and you know, we've seen it in 2016 and 2020. They're always bad. Like president's always bad, but, these have been some very bad choices and, and still like, I think the best case, you know, we could almost hope for, for some of them is that they just sit it out. <laughs> but, but yeah, if we can get some people to vote Joe Jorgensen, that would be uh, um, amazing. I, I, I know you also, um, you, you've got a, a STEM background too, right? Is that, you know, is that common? Like your, your workplace is also like that. Is that, did you ever uh, thought about that? Or if you don't want to talk about that, that's, that's fine too. But the idea that they're both kind of like super male dominated spaces, is that know, what's wrong with me? Why do I like, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's why you're cool. No. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about all the people in my office mostly male the women are in inside sales or they're in marketing you know but so so for people who don't know i have an electrical engineering background that's how we met i was getting my master's at usc um i spent some time as a product marketing engineer in texas and now i'm mm -hmm. a sales engineer and even though it's sales which I thought would be more female dominated because, you know, we're personable and, and we like to talk. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I thought that would attract more women, but it still attracts a lot of men. And I think that's kind of, you know, the competitive side and, and taking risk and things like that. Um, so it, it's interesting seeing all of this come together is, you know, engineering background plus uh sales but yeah for most of my time it's it's been me and maybe a handful <laughs> of other <laughs> women no but that, that's very beautiful cool too which is yeah. great because Every that means whoever's going to be there is going to have a lot of grit like you know i'm right I'm, I'm sure you've had your fair share of like ignorant statements and um you know tmi moments you know from people so you know the fact that you're you're still in it and not just like uh you know in the background but you know you're being active progressing in your career while while also participating in the activism of the party is good and, and that's a good segue to can you tell me a little bit about like where you you said you were going for hornberger originally and obviously we're all we're all we're all a go for jorgensen you know dr jorgensen right, but right. Could you tell me a little bit about like the expectations and you know that the idea that you know part of it was digital uh, and then you know it goes to be in person for the other stuff just like the process and experience oh, man. that was crazy and it, it was my first uh libertarian convention so it, even weirder um <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i'm welcome <laughs> yeah hey we didn't have a naked man or shirtless man running across <laughs> the camera. So we're, we're better. We're progressing. Um, so I'm a part of the Mises Caucus. I joined mm -hmm. the Libertarian Party because of the Mises Caucus. Michael Heiss convinced me of this, this great vision of how we're going to build the party from the ground up, from the local level up, build that structure that the party's been really missing. And I, I still believe that I'm still working on that. Uh, that's why I support Joshua Smith for chair. There's my plug. Um, <laughs> there we go. So, um, and of course, the Mises Caucus and me personally endorsed Hornberger, Jacob Hornberger, as our uh, LP candidate, presidential candidate. And what attracted me to him was that he was just so 
unapologetically solid on the issues. Um, mm -hmm. He was not afraid to say, you know, the problem is the state. Here's it, identify the problem as the state. Whereas I felt like a lot of, I felt even Jorgensen in the debates and Gray was really bad at it. And no offense to Gray, I've met him, I like him. Um, it seems like they were going more of a compromise message, you know, oh, let's just make the government smaller this way. No, we still need this, we still need that. Hornberger was saying, no, abolish this, abolish that. This is wrong. This is immoral. And <laughs> and I it was kind of like Ron Paul. It, you had mm -hmm. that feeling. Um, it just I felt like he could really open people's eyes to the immorality of the state. So, you know, as a libertarian candidate, what I or for a libertarian candidate, what I want to what I was looking for was, you know, someone that had the message right, because. <sighs> I want a libertarian president, but I don't know when that's going to happen. I'm going to try my hardest to make it happen. Um, in our lifetime. In our lifetime. But, you know, we have to get the message right. Because for a lot of people, the presidential candidate is their one and only exposure to libertarianism, whether we like it or not. And there's a lot of small L libertarians that don't identify with the party. So I want to get the message right. Um, and that was my key goal there. Uh, the other goals are just kind of secondary to that, you know, ballot access and, and things like that. Um, so leading up, I, it looked like Hornberger was in the lead. Um, and so this kind of <laughs> caught us by surprise. So because of COVID, we had to do an online convention. It was it went okay. Um, it was kind of a mess leading up to it, but for everything that, um, considering everything, it went okay. They did it over Zoom. There were probably better ways of doing it. No um, Zoom bombings? No, <laughs> right. Uh, I Well, I don't know. <laughs> it, it was very hard to uh, certify people, to certify that you were a delegate. So who knows? <laughs> this This was a mess. And what's funny about it, is in 2018, the Mises Caucus tried to form this, um, oh gosh, like this committee to where we could come up with a, a uh, an encrypted online method of kind of doing something like this. Mm -hmm. And so it passed, but it never got real funding and real attention. And so it never came to fruition. And, and we felt like it was a personal attack some people feel it was personal against the Mises caucus. And so it's kind of mm -hmm. funny that then it came to this and that would have been really handy. <laughs> um, so hopefully we get something like that soon. Um, yeah. The technology is there. You know, I know people use signal WhatsApp. Some people don't like WhatsApp cause owned by Facebook, but you know, signal WhatsApp, uh, I've used Slack before. I don't know if you use Slack before professionally. I think it's clean. I don't know how encrypted it is, but I know some of these technologies are there and we have these these tech savvy people. It's interesting that Joe Jorgensen seems to have enough of the the radical policy positions that I think you and I would appreciate more in the Mises Cossack because who I, w I think I easily line up with the most out of everybody represented there. Um, you know, I, I trust Scott Horton on pretty much anything. And he, as soon as he said Hornberger, I said, I'm there too. Uh, <laughs> um, he, he's great. He came out to LA before for uh, an event and I got to meet him and I'm going through his book on Afghanistan right now, but you know, and anyone that they would have chosen, I think is there on, on terms of policy. But like you mentioned, the sort of flair, the, the presentation element, the coming at your throat is, is something that I think the the more you know i don't know how to describe it the 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 burr and the and the gary johnson and you know that whole uh side of the the aisle would not have been you know the sarwaks would not have been satisfied with someone who was a, a firebrand in that way for me I'm, I'm right there with you and i think it's because we have this assumed sense of like 
indignation or, or righteous anger at these things which we view as injustices. Whereas the other people are coming from a totally different philosophical framework. And I've come to realize that if you don't agree on, on first principles, there's not a lot that you can do. You can kind of talk about it, at least make people think about it critically. But people, you know, they have their assumptions like, you know, uh, some people just put animal lives before human lives. You know, I'm I'm never going to be able to get on the same page. You know, I am, you know, you call me anthrocentric or whatever slur, you know, you come up with, but I, I am, you know, Alex Jones will say it too. He's he, he, <laughs> exactly yeah. He, like, like he's, he's going to be, you know, human, human first and I'm going to be human first too. So it's like, um, Murray Rothbard had a piece years ago. I don't know if you ever read it. Do you hate the state? And I really liked it because, um, he, and he didn't know somebody like Glenn Greenwald and Jeremy Scahill. And I mentioned them earlier, like the folks at The Intercept, because when they talk about prison and war and, you know, decriminalizing drugs, all the issues that we would agree on, you could tell, like, you know, these are people who not for a show, not to go, you know, kneel with a kente cloth, you know, like the Democrats did recently, but like genuinely would have tears over people who are imprisoned. Genuinely, like even Michael Malice, like he genuinely had tears when Kim Kardashian would petition Donald Trump to release like real people getting released from prison. Whereas the other people that just kind of like go for economic efficiency, change things here or there, you know? And I think that the the Jim Gray, the Gary Johnson, they're more like utilitarians and consequentialists so that, you know, let's do what's just a little bit more good. And, and there's no, there is no sense of indignation. That's why I could hear people like, you know, like I said, Cornell West, I'll throw as another person up there, you know, we have radically different views on economics, but the things we do agree on, we're going to agree on with the same passion. Angela Davis has been going around speaking everywhere, talking about prison abolition. I, I don't know if you've, you've caught that, like that, that type of like sadness that that's what I see. And I wonder if we would ever, you know, I don't want to be too much of a Debbie Downer, but like if we'd ever be able to get like a real firebrand because there is that, you know, that wing of the party that is like, uh, -uh, uh, -uh we got to look good, you know? Right. I mean, I think we're on our way because I, I think Jorgensen is a bit more radical in her messaging than Johnson. So mm -hmm. I think we have moved that over to window. Yes. Uh, so I'm happy where where we landed. Um, and, and that's an interesting point that you bring up, because now I'm thinking back to when I'm talking to go off on tangent, <laughs> when I'm uh, talking with my more liberal friends is I think they do come from that kind of passion, that kind of place of injustice. And so you can kind of relate on an emotional level there. And if you bring it more about the state than whatever else they're talking about, then we can kind of relate on the the libertarian issue there. Um, yeah, that, that's a really excellent point, though, that you make. Yeah, thank you. It's like, do you say, uh, and, and you know, it's like, do you mention that we're $16 trillion in debt? Like, what does that even mean <laughs> no anymore? Or, you know what I mean? Like, d yeah. as, you know, as much as I love and the Fed, you know, that was one of my earlier, you know, red pills. You know, I never read The Creature from Jekyll Island, but I, I did read Ron Paul's book and the Fed. And it's like, it, is that what I start off with? Or it's like, you know, the, the specific immediate harm caused to people by the state. I, I did a, a, a peer reviewed book review on Ta-Nehisi Coates's book, Between the World and Me. And Ta-Nehisi Coates is a, you know, a Bernie bro, people would call him, you know, if anything. But if you see the way in which he discusses, like he would talk about the way in which the police plunder and steal and batter black bodies. Like th these are quotes that I wrote about from the book. And then like it talks about black people trying to leave the South to go to the North. And then in the North, they found the same like vehicle of plunder. Like that's how he describes the police. Wow. When I when I read that language in his book, I'm like, that's an absolute bridge there, you know, versus someone who's like, did you know how much their budget was last year? It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's a totally different argument. And yeah. and I I mean, I'm not the type of person who just picks one. I, I do prioritize one over the other. And I think the issue why we always argue is like it's not one answer. Like the whole the point of liberty is like it's gonna be all of these things like we need a multi-pronged 
attack on Leviathan to take <laughs> Leviathan out. So it's not, you know, it's not, it's not one or the other. I, yeah. I actually, uh, I saw you post about it on Facebook and then I'm, I'm a regular listener. So I heard Tom Woods, uh, anonymously talk about a list that you <laughs> came up with and yeah. So shout out to you. I, I'm sure you wouldn't have minded. He was being very polite. He in, and you know, not getting your permission. So he didn't want to shout you out. Right. Um, but also how awesome was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I know. I, I didn't expect that at all. Um, I told him, you know, you can always give me credit if you're talking nice about me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what's funny about that episode, because um, that was the episode with Eric July, for people who don't know. Uh, he listed all that stuff, and then Eric July was like, yeah, that sounds good. And then they moved on. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, tell tell everyone who, in case they haven't heard yet, the Tom Wood show with Eric July, the most recent episode. I'm sure Eric's been on there a number of times. What was the topic, and what was your succinct list about? Um, oh gosh, I don't know if the topic was specifically police brutality, or if it was was that it, or what? yeah, yeah, that was the main thrust of it. But yeah, just yeah. you know, reforms, like practical reforms. You right. Know, with all the vagaries, you know, some people going, let's defund the police. And they're like, well, let's not defund the police, but let's restructure the police. And and then, you know, all the sort of finagling. I think there are at least three or four different camps who are all using that slogan. And then, you know, Biden, of the many complaints that we have, has come out explicitly and said, we, I'm not doing that. No matter what definition it is, I'm not doing that. Of course he's not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And it was so Eric July's kind of viewpoint and I totally understand because he's an anarcho capitalist too was you know kind of that the state is in your mind you know if we quit believing that they have authority over us then that's then you know there's no more authority and and I 100% understand that and I wish I could have countered on that so I want to counter right now go uh, for it <laughs> I'm in I'm an ANCAP who I guess sold out because now I'm in the Libertarian Party. But um, when you- I don't think that, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so so the list that I made was more dismantling something. So, you know, ending qualified immunity, which we all know about now. Um, having police buy their own insurance instead of having the city and the taxpayers cover for them, you know, better training, having police from the neighborhood that they actually police instead of some centralized police that goes out and, and polices strangers. Cause mm -hmm. you wouldn't put a stranger in a, well, I can't say that now because George <laughs> Floyd and David knew each other. So, but yeah. for the most part, you wouldn't choke out your neighbor. Um, so just a couple of things like that. And the reason that I want to have real practical ways of peeling back the state is because let's say someone did believe, let's say a group of people did believe that, you know, police have no special authority just because they have a badge mm -hmm. and they saw this happening and they tackled the guy and, <laughs> and, you know, and save the man's life, save the other person's life. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to get punished. There's laws in place that protect, there's a brotherhood that protects the police. There's laws in place that protect the police. So there's no real incentive, even if you believe that there's no authority uh, or not, even if you believe that their badge doesn't give them special privileges, you're still going to be punished. And so you have to weigh it in your head okay, this stranger, is it worth saving their life? And that's a hard, a hard decision. Is it worth saving their life for me to go to prison and never see my family again? Or, or, or possibly get killed by a cop. And, and so I, that's why I still think we do need to repeal some of these laws and we need methods of making police more accountable so that people can come to that realization that there's no special privilege with a badge and so that they can have some kind of retaliation when police violate their rights. I, I agree. This is another place where, you know, people endlessly bicker. Are we gradual and incremental or are we abolitionary? Now I'm abolitionary, but I think I'm never going to get mad at a gradual or incremental step in the right, right way. I think many people have come up with like analogies, like as long as, you know, the train or the subway is headed 
in that direction. You know, I, I don't, I don't mind, you know, going with you one stop, you know, I don't mind that. It's not like a one way straight. Like we can make multiple stops as long as we're going the right way. I'm not going that way, but if you, as long as you're going the right way with me, you know, there's no issue. And, you know, Michael Malice also says that things happen gradually. And then all of a sudden, like you, you make those repeals. And then, you know, I mean, how, how many, how many times have we seen this police brutality, you know, against black folk, white folk, all folks, you know, I, I want to, you know, emphasize this point too, because you get, um, you know, there was a debate with reason magazine with, uh, John McWhorter and, uh, a, a professor Singh, and they debated this subject. And one of the things, if I, if you get to respond to Eric, I get to respond to them, to that <laughs> debate I watched. Uh, one of the things I would add is like, it's not one or the other. Now, now they were doing a Soho forum debate, you know, with Gene in uh, New York. So this is one of those things where, you know, you have to kind of play it up a little bit, but if I'm looking at it objectively and seeing, you know, what's the value to everyone's side, there is a genuine systemic racism in the way in which the system was set up and used and abused. Most of that has gone away. Some of it still exists and people are still taking advantage of that, but we can't chalk up everything to just racism. Like it, there's a lot of people, black people are being disproportionately killed by the police, but everyone is being killed by the police. Everyone's being abused by the police. So. It's, you know, it's not an either or. And I really hate when people try to, you know, box me in. Don't box me in, bro. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's both of those things. Like, it's, it's right. both of those things. And so your repeals are absolutely necessary. And then, you know, if we can, you know, think differently and, and they vanish too after we repeal some of their power, that's great. And like you said, no normal person would, you know, put to death someone that they know that intimately. And if it's the case with the reforms that we do, if the police are still messing up, we could look at them and adjust and say, well, this reform thing isn't really working out. So we're going to have to try more. <laughs> we have yeah. to take it uh, another step forward. So I, I think that was good. And there's like, there's no way uh, for you to feel bad at all, you know, being a part of the party or, or something like that. Like this is actionable change and nobody has, you know, a monopoly on, on how we're going to get to Ankapistan or wherever it is where, where you know, Galt's Gulch or wherever we're trying to well, there, there uh, get There wouldn't be to. a monopoly in capitalism, right? No, <laughs> <laughs> ideally not. Ideally not. I, well, that's what we're trying to do. We're just mm -hmm. antitrust people trying to bust up the police monopoly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's and great. actually joining the party with the Mises caucus has made me feel kind of more welcome too, because a, a good portion of the Mises caucus are ANCAPs. Um, and then there are small L libertarians in there too. I mean, it's a good mix of people. It's the Ron Paul people that join. Mm -hmm. so, so I haven't felt too bad. And then there's the RADS, the radical caucus that's, you know, anarchist and so oh what's the difference i don't know about that one tell me about that one um okay because i knew about the yeah. socialist caucus and then i knew yeah. about the more kind of moderates who really i think are just like uh republican school with drugs the, the prags <laughs> the pragmatist yeah mix our work yes so i knew them and the socialists yeah. but i didn't know about the radical so there's a radical there's audacious and I don't actually know what the Audacious Caucus is about, so I'm not <laughs> going to speak for them. The Radical uh -huh. Caucus, I've I've met a couple of them, and we relate very very well because you know there are a lot of anarchists. I feel like we feel we're very very similar. Mm -hmm. I'd say where we're different is I think the the Mises Caucus definitely has an emphasis on Mises on Austrian economics. Um, I don't believe that exists with a radical caucus. I could be mm -hmm. wrong. Sorry if I'm wrong, but uh, we do have a specific emphasis on the Austrian view of things. Um, and then we're very motivated in building the infrastructure of the party and supporting local candidates. You know, we fund local candidates, we volunteer for local candidates and focus on winnable races. And yeah. I just haven't seen that activism from the Radical Caucus. I've just seen the the viewpoints from the Radical mm -hmm. Caucus, which I appreciate. But um, 
I just feel the Mises Caucus kind of brings that structure along with it. Yeah, you're more organized. You know, yeah. I'm probably going to butcher the quote, but John Adams a long time ago said that that's all you need is like a, a firebrush lit by a small minority. And, and I think, um, um, was it Margaret Mead had a similar quote that the way the world has ever been changed is, is by a small group of, of dedicated individuals. So that, that that's cool to to hear. I'm going to have to look into the different caucuses and and study them more. I'm, I'm sure the Mises one is is where I'm going to be. You know, I think terms like libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, anarchist, I've debated, you know, so many times, even like, you know, Mises has the book liberalism. So even the word liberal, whether you say radical liberal, classical liberal, there's so many debates on words that I often try to use them as conversation starters rather than closers. But I tell you one thing through and through is um, for me, it was the Austrian economics. It was like the, you know, the kind of rigor of that. And it's almost incredible to me sometimes that some people find no interest at that because, you know, that's one of the things, like I was just talking on on Twitter with the the folks that that run the, the Gravel Institute. I don't know if you know those like two teenage boys. And I was talking about how, you know, Ron Paul got us to read lengthy economic texts. You know, I read Human Action. Uh, there were times where I definitely wanted to quit. You know, it's a very long 800 page book and it's the, some of the most ridiculous, you know, English, you know, uh, he, what he, he says, axiom, every other word, you know, you got to learn things like praxeology, um, was, um, didactic, not, not even didactic, didactic's an easier, apodictic. He would say like, when he wants to just like, I blew up your argument, he'd be like, this is apodictic, you know, <laughs> like, it's like, it's, it's, it's crazy, you know. Right. Um, but getting through things like that, reading about the Federal Reserve, like that's Austrian economics. So I would definitely, you know, I'm no economist, but, you know, as a hobby, I definitely read Austrian economics. And I would say I identify more with Austrian economics than any one other, you know, label. But obviously, like the Austro-Libertarian, that's the way, you know, Dr. Walter Block always talks about it. That's like a obvious connection. But, you know, kind of to what we were saying earlier about people bring different things to the tables. So, um, you know, that's, that's different, it, you know, especially like when people start talking about like violence against police and stuff, that's where my more religious and um, closer to pacifist, if not quite pacifist views come in, where, you know, it it's kind of cool seeing some of the stuff and the language and the rebelliousness. But um, I think I'm more practical in that way. And it seems like you do too, you know, like people who have something to live for, who are not trying to like die for the cause in this way, who, who are, you know, trying to progress in their career and, you know, start a family, maybe things like that are, I think not as much, uh, carrying the, mol the Molotov cocktails, but, but right. still radical in our own <laughs> ways. Right. It's like radical in our words, right? Not, not a yes. <laughs> yeah peace and prosperity we just <laughs> we're just trying to thrive do, do you have anything else that's uh going on that you like you, you gave a plug earlier for a chairman what was their name again joshua smith so he's running for chair against nick sarwark for the libertarian party we're gonna have our in-person hopefully we'll have our in-person uh convention july 8th through the 12th in orlando if people can make it, it will be a blast. We'll have a Mises bash and everything. Um, so him for chair. Mm -hmm. Right now, I, I'm actually the state uh, campaign director for the Jorgensen campaign. So nice. I'm all in right now. <laughs> nice. Um, so please check out Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen. Spike is great. Oh, I my don't God, know yeah. He, okay, so you've heard some of his work. Um, he's very yeah. solid and not just the trolling, like cool. the genuine, right? <laughs> he, he's a great troll too, but he's really good at, um, uh, you know, articulating our principles. Um, so it's good to have those two together and it's interesting seeing the messaging there as well, because they've kind of framed Joe as, as this, um, as you know, the more approachable candidate. And then they framed Spike as, you know, the youth. He can reach out to the youth. Uh, so I love it. I think it, I think we're going to bring a lot of people to libertarianism. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, but she has she has examples. <laughs> no, that's good. Th those are good. Those are good. We'll look out for that. And that's a, 
a replacement that will be well worth it. So I, you know, I hope, I hope for all the, all the best in that. And you're welcome anytime, you know, anytime, if there's anything on your mind, hit me up and we'll jump back on here. Thank you so much for uh, joining me so early on in the show. Yeah. Thank you so much.